Every tree that does not bear good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. The gospel concerns, or especially, the shepherds. The epistle is more general and applies to all those who are baptized into Christ. Having put aside the works of the flesh, and they are still out there, and if we're not careful, are only too ready to come back into the system. Be careful because things now aren't so well defined as they were maybe 30 years ago. I remember being on a train when I was a student, this is going back to the mid 70s, and I happened to be coming back from Shrewsbury to Aberystwyth, and on the coach were a group of men who were passing to each other glossy magazines. And I overheard one saying to the other that he didn't use to look at pornographic material. Now, that horrified me, but now, if one looks around, that glossy magazine material is in respectable people's pocket. It might also be in yours, if you twiddle in the wrong area. I think I know, you know what I mean. Be careful, therefore, because this stuff is demonic. And I remember years ago in Italy, this is going back to before the millennium, late 90s, a friend of the community who was intelligent, he had a doctorate, he did say this, because there was no question of internet in the community at the time, he said, internet is not indifferent. And he explained why. He knew, and he knew how demonic it could be. And monasteries are hesitant to have it in any way in the house because they know what's in there and the damage it can do. So be careful because that's now one of the portals wherein demons are happy to get in and get lodged in, in your mind. Once these things have been seen, they've been seen forevermore and your memory will never cancel them. They're there and they're demon infested to bring you down. Now, the pastors are a specific category. They're there not to be in category A, but to be at the service of the flock, to get them to heaven. That would explain why there's a particular interest on the part of the demons in them. If they can weaken them, or even better, make them fall, it's a great victory because of the consequences that follow. Are you sitting uncomfortably? Then I shall begin. This came out in a series of exorcisms in, now, one was in 1977, the 8th of December, they try to do big exorcisms on Marian days because it's more powerful against the demon. Another was on the 25th of March, and the other, this one, the main one, was on the 5th of April, which was the transferred feast of the Annunciation because of Holy Week that year. And this is what came to the surface. It turned out, because you know that the exorcist has to ascertain who is in there, names. And amongst the demons in this person was a certain human demon. It can happen. It was a lost priest. And his name came out, Verdi Garandieu. He had been a priest in the Diocese of Tarbes in the south of France, in the area of the Pyrenees, in the 1600s. So, it's a long time ago. And he has this which he's obliged to say out of obedience. By a divine mercy, this was allowed to be heard that we might be warned. It concerns not just the priests, because we're all 
in the business of saving souls, and we need to be aware of what's going on in the priesthood, because what the devil wants, of course, is souls. And he's going to hit there, and he can use us also, be careful, to bring a priest down. There are many ways of doing that, and one subtle one is to discourage him by criticising him, being unhelpful to him, and so on. What a stupid thing I did, not responding to grace and leading the life that I led. Then, while uttering woeful cries, he exclaims, making the possessed woman jump to her feet, Why did I let myself go that way? Why? Listen to this bit. Why did I agree to being admitted to the priesthood? This very heavy responsibility, since I was not equal to it, if I was not prepared to take the trouble to lift myself up to the heights of this great ideal. Why did I give, what is this, bad example? And notice this bit. As thousands and thousands of priests do today, by not acting in accordance with my priesthood. Notice this. Why didn't I teach the catechism as I should have done? If one scratches a little, one is horrified to see how little catechetical knowledge is out there amongst the common people. They haven't a clue. And therefore, huge sins are never handled because no one ever told them. And moreover, if a priest now dares to say things which they don't really want to hear, he will be silenced. And there are ways and means of making sure he'll be silenced. I spent my time looking at the women's dresses rather than observing the commandments of God. The truth of it is, I was neither hot nor cold, I was lukewarm, and the Lord vomited me from his mouth. In my youth, notice this, he started well. I was still good, I still responded to grace. And notice this, while he was speaking, we heard his cries through the possessed woman, because the grace was in his hands. He didn't have to end up where he'd ended up. The same, of course, applies to Judas, and he also has been heard in exorcism in Germany, in the case of Annalisa Miguel. It was later that I became lukewarm. It was when I entered onto the wide and easy road of pleasure and abandoned the narrow road of virtue by not responding to grace anymore. And from then on, I felt lower and lower. Now notice the progress. At the beginning, I used still to confess my sins. I wanted to change myself, but I did not succeed because I no longer knew how to pray adequately. I did not respond to grace because of this stupidity. I went further down to the stage of coldness. Now here we have, as in human marriage for instance, coldness coming in, there's no relationship anymore, no encounter, one is functioning. Between this stupidity and coldness, there is only the distance of an onion skin. If I had been warm and ardent, I would not have known this wretched destiny. If the priests of our time do not pull themselves together, oh, well, they will be 
finish the same fate that I have. At the present time, there are thousands, tens of thousands of priests in the world who are like me, who give bad example. And by the way, it's been picked up elsewhere that one of the things that lead priests and bishops, and I think even cardinals, to the wrong place forever is not teaching correctly, teaching incorrectly, and leading astray. <laughs> who are lukewarm and who no longer respond to God's grace. Or, if they do not change themselves, will have a destiny no better than that which I, Berdi Garandieu, have had. Ah, uh, what a destiny for me in hell, if at least I have not been born. That's an echo of scripture. If I were able to come back to life again, ah, uh, how I would love to return to earth in order to live a better life. Ah, uh, how I would love to spend my nights and my days on my knees in prayer, calling on the Most High. I would invoke the angels and saints of heaven in order for them to help me to leave the road to perdition. But I can no longer go back. I am condemned. And by the way, the more responsibility one has, the greater the risk. Maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but you can look it up for yourself, it's objective. I was shocked when, some years ago, I had a nun from Italy who was a brilliant scholar and was full of facts, ancient and modern. And she told me something I didn't know. She said this with regard to the Reformation. And she was big into history. She went all the way to London to investigate the Tower of London and so on. And she said this, possibly in the context of putting a statue of Martin Luther in the Vatican, on the wall, I think. She told me that Pope Benedict had beatified a few years ago a certain foundress, a mystic soul who had founded the congregation of the angels, Sword Serafina. And she was on a journey and had got off the train and wanted to do an hour of adoration and got on her knees before the closed door of a church because she couldn't do it inside. And an angel tapped her and told her to get up because the church where she was kneeling was a Protestant church. Moreover, she had happened to land in the very place where Martin Luther had been born and she didn't realize it. Enzibel. And there was a big noise because the whole area was in feast of that event, including the Kaiser. And she was to be shown something which left her dumbfounded. The angel wanted to show her that it is not what men think of us that changes eternity one little bit. On the contrary, to be applauded by men can be very, very dangerous. And it seems, and this is what she saw, she was shown the abyss. It opened before her eyes and the angel wanted to show her where the person being feasted was. He was right down there and there were demons trying to force 
a big nail into his hand, precisely the part of his anatomy which had brought the church into a huge division never healed, splitting off a huge chunk of Europe from the Catholic Church. And after that, she was very strict on one point with her own nuns. She would never tolerate one fault in the slightest, anything against the virtue of holy humility, because pride had got in, unfortunately, it would seem, into this otherwise interesting Augustine monk who had translated the Bible into very good German, and still use it, and he was taken up by this support he had from men which gave him independence. And independence is akin to pride. And when he comes in, the Lord can't get through. We're not listening anymore. We know more than authority. And we become our own authority. If it happens to a brilliant scholar as him, it can happen to us too. I remember being warned that by my superior in France. Is complicit pumping on obeisance? Can one be mistaken in obeying? True greatness is not of the order of applause. And so we want to be aware that we're before something hugely demanding when it comes to the priesthood. And in this context, I want to conclude by inviting you to be aware of what you can do in this cosmic battle for the salvation of souls, in which we're all involved. Because the bottom line, my friends, is heaven or hell. In fairly recent times, just after the war actually, a holy nun died in obscurity in Italy. Its sister Consolata Petrone, Capuchin of Petra Elevation, and she had many gifts from the Lord, but she had a message for mankind, which counterbalances what I've just been telling you about the danger. It's the fact that the Lord is the one who suffers most when a soul is lost in his heart of Redeemer and spouse especially when it comes to his consecrated. But he's hurting because he's abandoned by his own. Listen to this. It's in 1934 that she hears this. Jesus reveals to me the intimate sufferings of his heart, caused by the faithlessness of souls consecrated to him. After this, she began to have a burning desire to make reparation for the sins of the world and to lead sinners to Jesus. And thus began the intense spiritual relationship and intimacy between Jesus and Consolata. Together in love, together in pain, together to deliver a countless number of souls to the Father who seeks them in his infinite love, mercy and compassion. After all, it was the Lord himself who told her, do not think of me as a harsh God, because I am foremost the God of love. And then she's given this, which I hand on to you. It was then that our Lord also inspired Sister Consolata with this important universal prayer. Jesus, Mary, I love you. Save someone. Remembering what Jesus had told her on the day that she took the veil, I do not call you for more than this act of continual love. Sister Consolata began to thus repeat this one prayer over and over again during all her work, waking hours in every form of work as she went about her daily duties. For it was Christ himself who instructed her in the practice of what he called the unceasing act of love expressed in the words, Jesus, Mary, I love you, save souls. Concerning this prayer, our Lord said, Tell me, what more do 
beautiful prayer you want to offer me. Jesus, Mary, I love you. Save souls. Love and souls. What more beautiful prayer could you desire?